episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, another really fascinating guest helping to create a better tomorrow uh, on many different fronts. Uh, today, we have the opportunity to be joined by Dr. Morten skybuck uh, who is Associate Professor uh, at the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine uh, and at the Center for Healthy Aging at University of Copenhagen. Uh, Dr. skybuck Knudsen did his uh, medical degree at University of Copenhagen and worked briefly as a physician in Denmark and in Greenland before turning to uh, science, uh, where he did his postdoc fellowship uh, at Wilhelm Bohr's lab at the National Institutes on Aging uh, here in the U.S. at the National Institutes of Health, uh, where he utilized a variety of state-of-the-art approaches to understand how DNA damage uh, contributes to aging, uh, ultimately discovering uh, that neurodegeneration generation uh, in several premature aging diseases is partly caused uh, by hyperactivation of DNH damage responses, uh, one that we talked about previously, PARP1, uh, on the show, uh, and that this activation ultimately uh, led to a loss of a variety of uh, vital metabolites, including a nicotinamide adenamide dinucleotide and acetyl enzyme A. Uh, importantly, showing and facilitating uh, that uh, we can ultimately intervene in the aging process by inhibiting uh, and augmenting the levels of these various metabolites. Uh, in his own lab, he continues to focus on understanding aging, combining various approaches, machine learning, uh, as well as a wet lab uh, analyses with the ultimate goal of developing various interventions for age-related, uh, age-associated diseases and aging itself. Uh, Dr. Shabit Knudsen is also the chief editor of Frontiers in Aging. Uh, he's on the advisory board of the Longevity Vision Fund, uh, as well as an uh, advisory board member of Molecule Protocol Organization. Uh, Morton Shabit Knudsen, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. It's great having you. Um, you know, I'd like to start off, uh, as we typically do, by handing you the floor uh, for a few minutes just to uh, tell us a little bit more about your journey, if you could sort of take us back a little bit to everything from sort of where you grew up, uh, how you got interested in medicine, and sort of your, your curve into uh, aging and the diseases of aging. I think that'd be a great way to, to lay the ground for everything we're going to be talking about. Sure. Uh, so I am originally from uh, the Copenhagen area, uh, where I grew up, and uh, I had, a, I think, a very normal childhood uh, but I was always sort of fascinated about aging and growing old. You know, you see your grandparents grow old. I think that many people in the field can sort of recognize that story. Uh, and just, you know, wondering why, why this happens and um, the sort of inevitability of, of death. You know, this is, uh, uh, I think, Part of what has driven me to where I am, and so in in Denmark, when you finish high school, you decide if you want to go into medical school. And I went into medical school, particularly with the idea of I, th I thought that would be a good approach to be able to develop interventions for humans focusing on aging. And so um, I did do a little bit of research while I was in medical school, focusing on mitochondrial function. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had a couple of publications coming out of that. Um, my first publications are in sort of basic mitochondrial function. And then um, I uh, finished sort of a couple of tiers of board certifications and then went, as you mentioned, to the NIH in Baltimore. And um, my idea was always to, to try to push research towards an interventional uh, angle. So I've done that, I think, in, in every aspect that I've done in my research, trying to understand the molecular basis of particular observations and then seeing if we can develop interventions for that. Um, so this is my journey and uh, I was fortunate to be able to come back to Copenhagen and, and I've been lucky with getting a reasonable amount of funding to run a, a nice group here and 
I've been very fortunate to collaborate also with some great people in the in the field, which which um, I think are very important for research. It, it really takes a village to drive the field forward, and Absolutely. you cannot do everything yourself for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, um, you know, I've, I've spent, you know, time going through a lot of your, your publications and you published quite a bit. And I think, uh, you know, a great place to start off, I think to lay the ground for a lot of what you're doing now is, is this really fascinating uh, paper that you published in um, the journal Aging 2019 uh, entitled The Define Human Aging Phenome. And, and you basically walk us through um, the sort of the history here we have, obviously a, a decent understanding nowadays that aging is this bad thing causes a lot of diseases. We're generating a lot of different types of biomarkers nowadays. Clinical trials are beginning to happen, uh, but we're still lacking sort of this connection between biomarkers and, and all these changes we're seeing and the phenotypes of aging. Uh, talk a little bit through this paper, if you would, and, and exactly you know what a human aging phenome is all about and why it's important. Yeah, I mean, this this uh, is a very interesting topic. It's uh, something that have uh, that actually started a, quite a while back. The, the first sort of approach to this was uh, I made this database of mitochondrial diseases, where we look at uh, um, monogenic defects and how that translates into a phenotype. And in biomedical research, people are using animal models and phenotyping animal models. For example, mice, you create a knockout mouse, and then you see, you observe how does that impact aging or age-related features or other features. Uh, but we have a huge amount of data actually on humans. And I think biomedical researchers don't really realize that there is a lot of data already on humans out there and on how phenotypes associated with specific uh, genetic mutations. Uh, so this is... Um, this is the, the basis of that paper is to try to define human aging so that we can also identify uh, diseases that are associated with human aging. Mm -hmm. And the way we did that was uh, we had a previous collection of phenotypes that we felt were associated with human aging. This is like graying of hair, facial wrinkles and things like that. Sure. And we had a prevalence of, of, of that particular, those particular features in an elderly population. And then we, downloaded PubMed, uh, basically. And, um, and then we searched for terms that co-occurred with our relatively meager list of features in aging. And then that allowed us to, to see sort of which features are enriched in aging and, and how um, allowing us then to describe, um, to describe human aging. And so this, I think, there are some, you know, basic things in aging that we don't understand. We have a really very limited understanding of how specific features are associated with specific processes. In the context of stuff that I've been doing, which is um, premature aging disorders, where you mm -hmm. see typically um, DNA damage or DNA metabolic defects, mm -hmm. you often see issues with the um, with with the tissues that are very dependent on, on DNA metabolism and maintaining DNA genome stability. And these are replicating tissues. So for example, uh, hair loss uh, is a and graying of hair are very prominent in premature aging diseases and also very prominent in human aging. And then there are other things like neurodegeneration, which is actually very rarely seen in premature aging diseases but it's, it's uh, very prominent in mitochondrial diseases. So you can sort of associate different phenotypes with potential different um, hallmarks of aging, which is what we also did in that paper. Uh, and this gives you a sort of an idea of, of which pathways could you potentially target if you want to target a specific aspect of aging. And I think um, most people would agree that it, it would be very difficult to have a single treatment for aging, right? Sure. It's a, such a complex um, process that you probably need to target many things. 
and it's um and, and you know working off of sort of the you know you're mentioning we we a lot of people don't realize the amount of of clinical data human data that's already out there and we'll we'll get to that in a little bit uh, when we get into uh sort of the, the longevity pill uh project and all that um i'd love to stop at uh your work in uh dna damage now because you've uh, done a lot of publications in this area, a lot of work, uh, recent paper, you have the trends in cell biology in 2020, protecting the aging genome, uh, where, um, you know, of, of this sort of uh, continuum where you have, uh, okay, we can reduce a, a bunch of the stuff that damages our DNA, great. Uh, then there's also obviously a lot of work we talked about senescence and, 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 and so forth on the show also. Uh, but you spent a lot of time in repairing DNA damage. And, you know, this is another fascinating area when you just look at sort of across the trillions of cells that we're made up of how much DNA repair actually happens in a lifetime. It's really staggering uh, that we are held together so well over time. Um, in this paper, you know, you talk about some of the different concepts of, of how we could potentially uh, develop drugs, develop interventions uh, that may enhance DNA repair. Um, talk a little bit of some of what you found out here. I know one of the areas that you were looking at specifically uh, that I've heard you lecture about is in, in hormetic substances, things that uh, sort of damage us but not cause DNA repair in their own right to, to stimulate some of that effect. Talk a little bit about some of what you've been looking at in this particular area of uh, enhancing our DNA repair processes. Yeah, so it's been known for a very long time that if you stress cells or if you stress organisms with a certain stressor and that uh, and the cells survive that stressor, then they become more resistant to subsequent types of stress. We know that from uh, exercise, for example, if you do exercise, you stress yourself. Sure. And then you become better at coping with that stress. You upregulate pathways that help you generate more energy, etc. The same is the case also for, for uh, DNA damage. And a prominent example is, is cancer cells, for example. If, if you are treated with a chemotherapeutic and, um, and you do not completely kill the, kill the cancer, then there's a risk that the cancer will eventually become resistant to the chemotherapeutic. So it's, it's a well-known phenomenon in the field, but it's been difficult to take advantage of that phenomenon. Um, and so we have collaborated with uh, a company called Silicon Medicine. Sure. Who's also very focused on aging. Uh, and we uh, screened a large amount of compounds for their ability to induce a DNA damage-like response. And so we screened, I think, more than 15,000 compounds and came up with a, a list of drugs that appear to be able to, to elicit this response. Um, and we tested these drugs um, and have found uh, a few drugs that are able to, um, which, which appear to be able to stimulate repair, uh, reduce the amount of senescent cells, sure. allowing uh, organisms to live longer and also allowing organisms to maintain their motor function with age. Um, so this is a very exciting uh, prospect. Um, the organisms don't live forever, but uh, we are also probably also only just fixing one part of the aging issue, right? Uh, I think it is fascinating though that, that we're able with this compound to actually um, reduce the amount of sort of persistent DNA damage foci. So these are types of DNA damage that exist in your cell and are not repaired over time. Sure. Um, normally you get a lot of damage, as we mentioned, 100,000 lesions every day in each cell in your body. And the vast majority of those uh, lesions are repaired. But over time, a few lesions accumulate. Um, and so when you are about when you're a 70 year old person, then maybe you have in your senescent cells, you have probably three lesions that accumulate and this is enough to drive a, a cell to, towards senescence. This is stuff that truth can piece is young. Sure. Um, but for some reason, our drug is actually able to reduce these persistent lesions, allowing cells to actually rejuvenate and become proliferating again. Um, so this is 
we're not completely sure about how that actually happens, but we have we have some uh, work in progress in that regard. And uh, I think that we will know probably uh, very soon mm -hmm. which uh, which proteins and pathways we're actually targeting. Yeah, I mean, mechanism of action work is <laughs> is exciting, but it could always take decades. But uh, seeing an outcome now, uh, going, sort of going back to this sort of this phenotype, if you're having some really good effect, I I always I always put that on top. That, <laughs> yeah, um, but um, you know. Obviously, you know, we're still learning a lot in this regard, but of course, you know, um, we have our, our nuclear DNA and damage there. Uh, as you mentioned, the mitochondria, which is the area you spend a lot of time on, that's got its own um, uh, its own DNA. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the epigenome has been extremely hot the last few years. Um, obviously, it, these are early days, but uh, can you say anything about sort of this <laughs> sort of this three-way thing. Because, you know, we always get these arguments, people, you know, about what oh, well, DNA is more important than the, than the epigenome, but you got the mitochondria there. Um, talk about how you think about sort of the, the three-way that exists between these different uh, control components of our genome yeah. and, and what keeps yeah. the cell alive. I mean, it's it, this is a very, very complicated question. The I started out as a mitochondrial, yep. very strongly mitochondrial person. Um, but there's a number of, I think, things to consider in, in the context of mitochondria versus nucleus, for example. As you mentioned, mitochondria have their own DNA, but in, in a cell, there's typically thousands of copies of the mitochondrial genome. We know, we know from mitochondrial diseases that you need to reach a certain level of mutations before, before you actually get a phenotype. So you can inherit um, mutation from your mom, mm -hmm. a certain amount of, you get your mitochondria from your mom. And so you can inherit, uh, you know, a certain mutational load from your mom and that does not give you any phenotype. Sure. And that mutational load is typically, you know, an order or several orders of magnitude higher than, than uh, what has been reported as an accumulation of damage in mitochondria over time. So, I think that maybe the collection of different mutations that you would get in mitochondria may be contributing to the aging phenotype. Uh, and certainly there's data showing that mitochondria aren't born in aging, but, but I'm, I'm more and more leaning towards a more nuclear focus, simply because in the nucleus we, we have two copies of each gene. So you need very, very few mutational events to actually completely remove some functionality of a of a cell in for mitochondria you need a lot more. Uh, in terms of the epigenome and changes in the epigenome, um, it's, uh, I mean, something has to be upstream to cause the changes in the epigenome. I think the epigenetic changes are extremely important, uh, but there has to be some sort of upstream event. Again, here as a, in my completely unbiased opinion, uh, it makes sense, you know, that, that you get DNA damage, uh, which uh, occurs due to the metabolic activities of a cell. And then that leads to, to changes in the epigenetic landscape. Um, of course, metabolism has a strong effect on epigenetics also, you know, simply altering the NAD and DH ratio can change activities of of, uh, of enzymes such as sirtuins. Mm -hmm. So mitochondrial dysfunction, where you get a change in the NAD and DH ratio could impact sirtuin functionality. On the other hand, we've shown that DNA damage can impact mitochondrial function also. So it is a very complicated uh, three-way, uh, and I, I'm sure there is feedback mechanisms from all levels and um, we also know, for example, mitochondrial dysfunction leads to increase in oxidative stress, which can then lead to damage to the DNA in the nucleus. So there is, uh, there is, it's a very, very complicated relationship. And I'm, but if if I was to put my money on the most important part, which is you know what I do every day, you know I would put I would put it on the DNA repair. Um, 
because I think that this is the very upstream event. Yep. Um, the problem is whether or not we can do anything about it. This is the main question. Um, you're you're uh, you're taking uh, some some important steps in that direction. So it's uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, and, and I realize the uh, SFF three way is a a very unique. Uh, language let's say uh, and you know, a lot to learn you know you stimulate something when you were, you were mentioning before uh you know about the um, the premature aging uh, syndromes that you you know you've looked at over your career and i was just off to, you know one of the areas of biology sort of separate from this that has always fascinated me is uh, mosaicism uh mm -hmm. in some of these uh these genetic disorders are there like mosaic premature aging conditions somewhere between totally healthy and extremely pro that if you have just one version of that mutation, I was just thinking from some of the, um, let's say indirect sort of human um, experience to show what you know, the transition really looks like between the healthy and extremely yeah. damaged. I mean, that, that's a good point. Um... I was, I don't know, I was just out of the air yeah. whether that exists. But, but mo most of the most of the premature aging diseases are recessive, which means that you need okay. to inherit two bad copies from your from your parents. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's quite interesting that one good copy seems to be enough for people to live a a very a normal life okay. and with a normal. Um, health span so um there seems to be a threshold to many of these um, diseases that you, you you can get along with only having uh, not complete activity of this pathway but a certain level of this pathway is enough to be able to um, cope with whatever stress you have and also in addition which should be mentioned is that many of the pathways are that are involved in, in DNA repair in the premature aging diseases, there are redundancies. Okay. Uh, so in the very core uh, pathways, you don't really see, um, I mean, you, you, this is something you've seen, of course, in animal models. So if you knock out one of the core genes involved in, in a core process, then, the, the, then that is embryonic lethal. So you cannot get a healthy mouse out of that. Uh, so, so the diseases where you get mutations leading to premature aging are important, but they are not critical for cellular function. You know, your cells can survive for a number of years, um, but you just have a slightly higher propensity to accumulate damage. And then that gives you premature aging. Got it. Um, so that, that also, you know, speaks to the delicate balance that there is in cells, right? It's, it's a really, really fine-tuned machinery. Mm -hmm. Tiny changes um, can offset this homeostasis, and then that leads to, to premature aging. Yep. Uh, you know, Morton, this, you know, looking behind you there at the, um, at the conference, which, which you are one of the main organizers of Aging Research and Drug Discovery, uh, coming up uh, August and September timeframe. I've had some of, you know, your guests or, or your, your speakers on the show, uh, people like Shelley Buffenstein at Calico and Vera Gubernova, uh, who are involved in sort of, you know, this comparative genome work, naked mole rats and, and elephants and other <laughs> species that have, uh, let's see, a very unique genetic lottery. Um, but, you know, as they will point out, uh, it's not a matter of, of engineering me with extra copies of P53 because, oh, you make me tumor uh, resistant, you make my wound healing bad and so forth. Um, obviously, the very early days of, of genetic engineering and CRISPR and everything that's going to be coming. But are, are you in the lab looking at any interesting uh, genetic engineering experiments, CRISPR or otherwise, uh, if you slowly, let's say, amplify some of these DNA repair uh, genes, uh, what happens uh, to species, whether they're mice, rats, whatever, that you may play around with? Yeah, I mean, this is a great point. I mean, uh, I think there are, you know, a lot to be gained here, but um, it's a very difficult question. We are actually... This is some work that is uh, that has been in progress for 
actually quite some time, but it's a very challenging work. We are trying to make um, a new type of DNA repair of Bacta, okay. which is uh, it is a gene editing factor. It's not based on CRISPR because CRISPR is you know sequence specific, and if you want to stimulate DNA repair, you or you, if you want to create a new gene that can that can repair DNA, you do not want want it to be sequence specific. You want it to be able to work in your entire genome. So. Um, this is stuff that's ongoing, um, and it, it's it's too early to say we've made the enzyme and it actually works, but we haven't put it into um, cells yet. Okay, and um, so it would be some years before we can get into mice, I think, and then we'll see how it goes. But this is, I think, exciting work. You know? Yeah, and it gives us some idea about intervening in the sort of really basic upstream events. Um, and, uh, but we'll see. I mean, this is something we'll have to test experimentally. It's exciting times. So let's, let's transfer now into uh, humans. Um, and, you, you know, you um, have an article, Frontiers of Aging, entitled A Grand Challenge in Aging Interventions from Mice to Humans. And, you know, walk through a lot of the, uh, the, the, the topics here in terms of uh, biomarkers, in terms of the length of what clinical studies may look like and so forth. Great paper. Um, and now let's move over to the Longevity Molecule Project, because this is, Clearly, I mean, this is such an extremely elegant uh, topic and concept of what you're setting up here. Uh, billions of prescriptions, millions of individuals, half a century going through the Danish Health Service prescription database. We've done a major clinical study here the last 50 years. Uh, people taking drugs of all combinations and all sorts. Obviously you need your tools, your machine learning, your artificial intelligence. Um, you've, you've identified some, and, and so you know, I really look at this as sort of the, the metformin type thing, but on steroids, because as you were saying, it's not gonna be one drug. Um, these combinatorial interactions you have, I mean, you've taken an amazing step here, and this is just a fascinating project. Talk a little bit about what you're looking at in terms of not just repurposing, but in the terms of the combinations, uh, and then obviously nothing confidential. Are you seeing anything, um, you know, obviously you're, you're gonna run into anti-inflammatories and this and that. Are you seeing any really weird combinations of stuff that you wouldn't expect uh, that, wow, you know, this group of people here is living 20 years longer or lived a lot longer in the 1950s versus, uh, talk us through this, this is really neat. I mean, and well, first the good news is that we live longer now, right, than we used to sure. in most countries. Um, the, the data is vast, you know, so it's a, um, like you said, it's 1 billion, 40 million prescriptions. So, um, we actually haven't looked deeply into combinations yet okay. because this is a, this is actually a, um, challenge, you know, computationally oh, yeah. it's just massive. Uh, the data is so massive. Uh, so we're starting simply just looking at at um, um, single drugs that appear to affect uh, lifespan, and uh, we all, we have also looked at metformin in the. It's also yep. part of the database, mm -hmm. and um, metformin is um, does lead to a lifespan extension. If you're seventy years old, you get a slight lifespan extension, and then but you cross over the normal lifespan within 10, 15 years, mm. uh, if you look at the lifespan curves. So this suggests that the underlying um, disease, you know, you don't get metformin when you're healthy right. if under normal conditions, right? So there's an underlying disease that affects the, um, the uh, longevity of an individual. And this is the case for everything that's in the database. So mm -hmm. this has been a challenge to actually cope with that. And the way we have done that is to look for a similar, uh, um, because we have it, we actually have the data coupled with diagnostics so and healthcare records, which is unique in Denmark, I think. So we can, we can look at diagnosis where 
two different drugs have been given mm -hmm. or multiple different drugs. And then look at the drugs that confer the longest lifespan benefit. And here we have some that are much more potent than metformin. Put this beta down. But as you mentioned, you know, this is, there is a you know, huge amount of data. So there's yeah. a, uh, looking at the combinatorial aspect, it's really exciting, um, but also extremely challenging. You know, how, how, how many combinations, you know, how many drugs and, um, so, so, um, so this, this, is, this is definitely a place where there is a lot of research that can be done. And I think a lot of the knowledge gained. And I think the, a good point is that, you know, all these drugs are FDA approved. So, yep. and that means that it's very easy to, to transition into clinical trials and yep. uh, very easy for to implement it also in a society, right? If we find something that is strongly preventative, then mm -hmm. that it's a great, uh, at least for for societies like where you have universal healthcare, you know, it's a, that would be something that the society would be very eager to sponsor and persuade people to take these drugs. Uh, the other interesting thing I was thinking of also is when you do, and it, you know, it points to the importance of, uh, of all these new technologies, whether it's the AI or whatever, but when you do get to the combinatorial phase uh, and you can, you know, obviously, tweak this up and down, but um, it doesn't become a metformin situation where, hey, we, we're we going to do put all this money in and have no patent on this thing, but you can patent, and I'm sorry, thinking on business terms, but you can create very interesting intellectual properties based on combinations. Uh, and so I think there's something very elegant there as well that you're on to. So um, it's, yeah, we, when I was at Glaxo, we used to buy this data, the US sources of it all the time. I was like, well, there's all this data. And, and now you Thinking back, I'm like, wow, you know, this is this is really uh, a very interesting use. It was it was useful to send sales reps out, and uh, but for this, it's uh, it's you know it's, it's so amplified. And uh, yeah, this this is great stuff. Um, you know, thinking along these, and, and I this you haven't gone in this direction yet, but I just wanted to bring this up because I'm a big fan of natural products. Uh, you know, I, I came across this paper when you were at the um, uh, the NIH uh, anti aging efficacies of natural compounds, and here you're talking again about uh, the rapamycins and the resveratrols and so forth. Um, but once again, when you're not thinking of everything you're thinking of and you're sort of daydreaming about the future, obviously, aside from all the drugs, the billions and billions of prescriptions that uh, we've been taking as a society for the last century, uh, we've been also taking supplements, we've been eating certain ways and so forth. And you ever sort of, obviously, this is down the road, but dream about now that uh, integrated package here. So we have our, our drugs that do things, but uh, now we integrate diet and supplements and other natural interventions that we've all been taking for, for thousands of years uh, and putting it all together at some point. Obviously, it's not happening tomorrow, but do you think about that at all? Yeah, I mean, this is really exciting. Also, the uh, data that we have on that account is less uh, detailed sure. because the prescription data is you know, something that's been recorded. Sure. Uh, and uh, we generally don't record in Denmark, you know, what people take in terms of, um, you know, stuff that's that's over the counter. We don't really right. record that. But, uh, but there is like exposure data and um, other types of data that, that I think is beginning to become linked with, with this registry data that includes, for example, data from wearables, you know, your movement data, yep. something about where you live, you know, do you live close to a major street or are you out in the countryside and how does that affect your, uh, your aging? And mm -hmm. as I mean, and um, again, connecting that to, you know, a, a billion line database, then um, it gets, it starts to get really complicated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, but there is there's huge opportunities I think yeah. in this types of data and uh, the good p point is that you know we'll just get more and more of that data. This is what's coming and we have tools to understand it. So um, so um, we we just need to test it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I spent some time with the uh, the folks at NIH that were working on the million 
uh, genome project uh, and and also the VA. They have the, the Million Veterans Project, and actually they have many more than a million in there now. There's like seven million, and you know they're doing the wearables and they're they're looking at a lot of uh, the data that they've gone through those systems. So um, yeah, it's going to be a, a real data deluge, but it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be very beneficial uh, for folks like you that that think in in, in this way and and can put all this information together. It's 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 going to be a very interesting uh, few decades <laughs> coming forward with, with all this um you know more the, the other place i just wanted to ask you about because I, I again i you know as i said i found a lot of of your publications really fascinating but uh you, you wrote this piece nourishing the aging brain a couple of years ago in the scientist magazine and once again here we're coming back to uh to dietary innovations uh, circulating ketones and so forth but um Obviously, you know, you're thinking a lot about DNA repair and so forth nowadays. Uh, do you keep your mind in sort of the nutritional intervention side of things? Uh, obviously, no medical advice for the audience, but any interesting yeah. uh, nutritional interventions along the neuro uh, neuro health side of things that we should all know yeah. about? No, but I mean, absolutely. I, this is uh, you know part of the lab is focusing on, on metabolic changes and metabolic interventions, and um, we, you know, I, I started my group in 2016 and, um, and people that are not, maybe have not tried to start a research group. It, it takes a long time to get everything going, right? But we're finishing now actually one major study looking at ketones um, and how that affects um, your regeneration. Mm -hmm. And so I think ketones is a prime example of of an intervention where there is good evidence that this is beneficial particularly for your brain uh, so a ketogenic diet is probably healthy for most people one thing to keep in mind is that it's a very tough diet to follow <laughs> because you know you can't eat any any carbohydrates um but there are other things of course you can do intermittent fasting we, we actually have a clinical trial in the fall coming up where we're testing intermittent fasting and how that affects aging in humans uh, so this will be quite exciting i think um and um intermittent fasting will also s get you into a keto ketogenic uh, state or semi-ketogenic state depending on how long you fast um Obviously, you should exercise. This is very important. Sure. You should sleep well. This is also very important. Um, so there are um, for sure many sort of behavioral interventions that you can do that does not include taking specific drugs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So these are my these are my overall advices. Coffee seems to be really good for you, also uh. actually um there's a this is one of the only um i mean there's actually really good evidence that coffee is reducing uh, morbidity and mortality um even up to three to five cups a day you know so it's this is uh, good news for, for coffee drinkers um, so very good news for me yeah, uh, although, although <laughs> it, it's very, if you prescribe me coffee, I'd be 100% compliant. If you prescribe me fasting of any type, I'm 0% compliant. I, I think I have some genetic uh, disorder where I have to eat. My, <laughs> so yeah. if you told me the answer for aging was intermittent fasting, I'm I'm gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, these are, uh, yeah, no, once again, it comes back to the fact that we, we have a, we're doing a lot. We're going to be, we're going to be, it's going to be a very interesting future, but there are some very common sense interventions that we still uh, can all partake in. And, uh, and that's, that's important. We can't forget about this and you know, getting there. Um, Martin, coming to uh, the aging uh, at Research and Drug Discovery Conference, you're instrumental in organizing this. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the 2021 um, conference that's coming up. You have an amazing, uh, I can't go every, through everybody, but you basically have a who's who of uh, folks in aging. Uh, talk about how this has progressed over time from some of a smaller conference to uh, uh, it's grown significantly, uh, both uh -huh. in terms of the people watching it and, and, and the people you have here. Uh, uh -huh. but talk a little about that. 
I mean, this has been, uh, this is a very exciting conference, I think, and one of the only ones where you have a really combination of top people within aging and also drug discovery and also the investment component is present. So I think it's a, it's a great uh, place to be if you're interested in all that. Uh, it started, uh, this is the eighth uh, conference. Uh, I was not, it, it's Alex Chavaronkov that actually started the conferences and it was part of, uh, of MIPTEC in Basel in Switzerland initially. Mm -hmm. And I came in, I think, on the fifth, fourth or fifth, something like that. I think I was a speaker on the fourth, and then I helped organize the fifth and forward. Uh, and it was in Basel, part of the uh, Life Science Week in Basel in September. Sure. Uh, last year, um, actually about two years ago, I think, we were suddenly told that the Basel Life Science Week was canceled. And so we were um, desperately looking for places to be. And we uh, got in touch with Columbia University who wanted to host the meeting mm -hmm. for 2020. Uh, and then uh, obviously Corona hit and everything went crazy. And so we held it in Copenhagen. Uh, and this was a purely virtual conference, but because it was virtual, we were able to get uh, a lot of people participating uh, around the world and uh, a lot of delegates. So we were more than 2,200 participants, um, which was very exciting, you know, and um, I think it's great that there's so much interest about it. And so this year we uh, were also supposed to be in Colombia, but the Columbia University uh, again had to cancel because of Corona. So we are, uh, in Copenhagen again this year and next year we hope to be in Colombia next year uh, but this year we we have a another great program with top level speakers from around the globe um, including you know Jim Kirkland and mm -hmm. uh, Eric Verdon, David Sinclair, Michelle Bufenstein, Greg Orbanova as you also have yep. mentioned and a large number of other people uh, I think what, what would be extra exciting this year the, is that we also have a longevity medicine workshop. So mm -hmm. I'm a, a clinician as a, a physician as a background, mm -hmm. although I do mostly basic research. We also have a few clinical trials, but I do mostly basic research, but I've always had the translational um, focus and the interventional focus. So it's really great to be able to add this longevity medicine part to the to the conference, which will focus on on clinicians mm -hmm. that are interested in, in in targeting aging in the clinic, uh, and I think this is um, really a market, or a, not a market, but an area that hasn't really been focused very much in, <clears throat> in other contexts. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited about that. Um, that direction. In addition, we also have started this Inspire Longevity program, which is actually high school students that mm -hmm. are interviewing some of the top people in the field uh, about how they got into longevity and things like that. So this is um, very exciting, I think. Yeah, definitely, most definitely. And we'll, we'll put we'll put a link to uh, to the conference as well in in the in the show bio uh, when we go live. But. Fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, Martin, you know, just you mentioned, um, you know, some of your partnerships, uh, like within Silico and so forth. Uh, take a, a few minutes, if you would, to, to mention, shout out to anybody else that you want to, whether they be your partners, uh, obviously your members of your lab, other collaborators. Uh, take the floor on that one and, and, and uh, yeah. anyone else you want. I mean, for sure. I mean, this is a. Uh collaborative effort, you know, I'm, I've always been very collaborative in everything I do. And uh, it really takes a lot of people to push this field forward. <clears throat> and obviously people in my lab, I'm just extremely grateful for them to be able to, those are really the people driving mm -hmm. the research forward. You know, I'm just taking credit for everything they're doing. So, <laughs> which is terrible, but they are really the people that should get the credit. 
Um, but we have collaborators around the world. Um, at the Buck Institute, we collaborate mm -hmm. with Eric Burden. We collaborate with um, Riegel Hauk Cooper in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. and, um, Sarah Mitchell in Zurich and many other people. I think our most one of our I think emerging very interesting collaborations is at the clinical side where we have actually um, several clinical trials starting up targeting aging. So this is at and this these are people that are not uh, known in the aging field, but okay. um, particularly uh, Celeste Porsberg at at one of the hospitals here. I'm very grateful to be able to collaborate with her and that, that we can push some of our interventions into clinical trials, actually. <clears throat> um, extremely grateful for our collaboration with Silicon Medicine, which has been ongoing for five years, I guess, uh, and uh, the support and uh, by Alex, uh, Alex Yaronkov, you know, is, has been extremely beneficial. So I'm really grateful to work with them and we have weekly meetings with them and it's always a pleasure to, to speak with them. Um, um, who am I forgetting? I'm probably forgetting someone, but, but the, the, as I mentioned, there's, there, this is a, a large field and, it's a very collaborative field, and I think this is, uh, you know, one of the great benefits of being an aging research that that most people are really interested in helping each other out and driving the field forward to answer some of these really serious and um, profound questions that we have about aging. And as you said early on, you know, it's, it's going to take the village to, to get yeah. all this done. So, yeah, very, very important. Of course, uh, I, I need to, one more thing that I, I need to highlight, of course, I need to highlight the molecule people, the Vita Dao people, okay. which is this uh, longevity molecule project that we are pushing forward, you know, yeah. which I think will be a way to, um, I mean, which which could be revolutionary in the way we fund basic research and drug development. Actually, yep. so this one this is very exciting. Absolutely, <coughs> uh, Morton. What one one last thing while I have you, and um, yeah, as people watch the show and know, I, I typically give the bio of my guests to my children um, to read and see if they come up with any interesting questions for you. And I gave them yours. They didn't have any questions about aging or the science, anything like that. They looked at your bio and they said, Dad, he worked in Greenland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Um, nope. What were you, they just want to know, what, yeah, what yeah. were you doing up in Greenland? Did he get in trouble that you had to go to Greenland? <laughs> or no, no, no. Why, were, why were you up there and what was it like? I mean, I, I worked in the, in the capital city in Greenland, which is okay. a, a place of 15,000 uh, people so it's a small uh, city situated uh, at the east coast in Greenland um, I mean it was really an interesting experience I was there for six months uh, yeah. and working as a district physician so I took care of the ER and mm -hmm. also uh, acted as a family physician. I was also doing like this sort of CSI type of things, going out to nice. places where people were found dead and determining if crime had had occurred. So that was kind of interesting. Very. And it was a beautiful place. You know, the nature was just unbelievable. And I was actually very close to, to staying there um, because it was just, it was just a different experience. You know, it was, it was, um, a very very interesting place to be um but i but i you know i, I always had the calling to do aging research so yeah. I, I had to leave but uh, it was it was an amazing experience and i'm extremely grateful for also being able to have that uh tried that yeah I mean, as I said, they, they thought it was the coolest thing in the world and we've you know and going to europe and back they've we've flown over greenland and they're like wow he lived there this is <laughs> anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up. But yeah, it's, uh, no, it's a, you should yeah. definitely visit. It's a, an amazing place. Yeah. It's really beautiful, friendly people. 
It looks like it from the sky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Well, more, this is, you know, this has been a really great time. Um, you know, a very fascinating portfolio of both, you know, basic research and clinical exploration and, and really wishing you the best with all of this moving it forward. Um, very exciting. Um, for everybody that's going to be listening to this a particular episode on our podcast or watching on the YouTube channel. Uh, you've been listening to Dr. Morten Skabig Knudsen, Associate Professor, Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine and Center for Healthy Aging at University of Copenhagen. Uh, Morten, I just want to you know, take it's time to say thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us for a little while. Uh, I want to thank you for everything you're doing to advance the field. And as we say on our show, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow through what you're doing. A very, very exciting, inspiring stuff. Thank you so much, Ira. It's, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.